Have you ever made a really bad decision? And if so, what was the reason? In my talk, I will explain why many people make bad decisions and how you can prevent that. I will share simple methods that empower you to make better decisions and improve your life. And in the end, I will show you how these methods even saved my mother's life. Let us start with a simple example. Ten years ago, my car broke down, and so I was facing a decision. What did I have to decide? Think about it. My car was broken, so I needed another car that makes sense, right? At least that is what many people think. And ten years ago, I was undoubtedly one of them. I immediately started to search for cars to buy. Very quickly identified dozens of cars. And then I spent ages identifying the best car for me. In the end, I bought a car. However, it was a really bad decision. Let me explain to you why. Without thinking what I actually wanted in this decision situation, I started to search for cars to buy. However, what was my decision situation actually about? And no, it was not about to decide which car to buy. It was broader. It was about to decide which means of transportation to use. And buying a car is just one of many alternatives. I could also use public transportations, e-bikes, scooters, gone on foot and combined them. Certainly, one of them would have been better for me than buying a car. I didn't see the other alternatives. Without realizing it, I immediately made the decision that I want to use a car as a means of transportation. As a consequence, I just focused on cars. My decision-making behavior 10 years ago can be very good illustrated with the following picture. And no, these are not the latest Ray-Ban models. These are simple blinkers. They restrict our field of vision. And when making decisions, they're not very helpful. In my talk, I will show you how you can get rid of these blinkers. In 2017, behavioral economist Richard Thaler won the Nobel Prize in economics for the concept of nudging. He showed in numerous experiments that selecting an alternative mainly depends on how the alternatives are presented. On the cover of his book, nudging is depicted with a mother elephant gently nudging her offspring to do what's good for the little one. For humans, so-called decision architects take on the role of the elephant mother. They set a frame, helping people making better decisions. Let's have an example. Many people want to eat healthier. However, they often reach to the unhealthy foods anyway, so they decide situation against what they actually want. Assume that there's a well-stocked salad bar in the entrance area of a cafeteria. Then the eaters can be nudged towards choosing more often healthy salad instead of unhealthy french fries and burgers. However, it's not always possible that someone nudges you or you may not want that. For example, in highly individual or very private decision situations. For these type of decisions, Ralph Keeney extends the concept of nudging. In his book, Give Yourself a Nudge. The ideas empower you to become your own decision architect, and I will tell you how. Many people are reactive when making decisions. They see decision situations as problems which are to be solved, and often with little effort, they just identify the most obvious alternatives. And then, they spend most of the effort in evaluating the obvious alternatives, the so-called decision backend. Remember me in my car example. Instead of spending most of the effort in evaluating the obvious alternatives, you should spend more effort on the so-called decision front end and ensure that you identify an attractive set of alternatives to choose from. For doing that, you have to do three things. You have to define what your decision is about, you have to know what you want to achieve. These are your objectives. And you need to know how you get what you want. These are your alternatives. Let us start with the definition of a decision. 
Many people make wrong decisions. But this I do not mean that they choose the wrong alternative. No. I mean that they focus on the wrong to narrow decision situation. Often you will face a series of narrow decisions which are related to a broader decision situation. In essence, you will make several narrow decisions which collectively establish the chosen alternative for the broader decision situation which you did not explicitly recognize. Sometimes the seemingly better alternatives for the narrow decisions result in a poor choice for the broader decision. Sounds complicated? Let me illustrate that. Imagine your grandparents live six hours away. Your grandfather calls you and asks, would you like to visit us next weekend? We would be so happy to see you. What would you say? I would love to, but unfortunately I have already plans. We all have plans and commitments, don't we? So two weeks later, your grandmother calls you. Same result. And after half a year, you still haven't visited your grandmother, even though that is what you want to achieve. In my decision situation when I bought a car, I formulated the decision situation to narrow. Decide which car to buy. I didn't recognize the broader decision situation, decide which means of transportation to use. As a consequence, I searched very narrowly for alternatives and focused just on cars. Many people make bad decisions because they take decision situations as given. However, the definition of a decision is a decision itself. Being aware of this fact is a crucial step in making better decisions. In any decision, you can nudge yourself by actively thinking how you formulate your decision situation, actively decide on which decision you want to focus and how narrow or broadly you want to formulate it. The objectives are the reason why we make decisions in the first place. This can be nicely illustrated with a dialogue from Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, Alice to the Cat. Would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? That depends a good deal on where you want to get to. I do not care much where. Then it doesn't matter which way you go. If you do not know where you want to go, there's no point in going at all. At least, if your life objective is not just walking around. And we all want to achieve something for us, for our family and friends, and ultimately for our society. Therefore, we must be aware of our objectives. Do you know where you want to go? Do you know your objectives? Many people think they do. However, research has shown that many people know just 50% of their objectives, even in critical decision situations. So, but how can you achieve what you want if you do not know what you want to achieve? In my narrow decision situation, when I bought a car, I paid attention on the objectives, mileage, costs, and condition of the car. However, I was not aware of other objectives, such as environmentally friendliness, convenience, travel time which were relevant for my broader decision situation. Without knowing these objectives, I couldn't do anything actively to achieve them. There are many brainstorming methods to identify objectives. The problem is that most people do not spend reasonable effort in identifying their objectives. You can nudge yourself by actively thinking what you ultimately care about, and this will significantly increase the chance that you get what you want. Once you've figured out what you want to achieve, the next step is to find out how you get that. Studies by Ralph Keane and myself show that people on average know just 40% of their relevant alternatives. 
even in critical decision situations. Often, they even miss the most important, the best ones. It may sound trivial, however, you cannot choose an alternative which you have not identified before. Let me go back to the decision situation when I bought a car. Very quickly identified the obvious alternatives, and then I spent most of the effort in, ev in evaluating them. However, I missed many attractive alternatives. For example, public transportation or an e-bike. If I had been aware of my objective, environmentally friendliness would have been so simple to identify more and better alternatives. So how can you identify better alternatives? The answer is simple. Use your objectives and spend more effort. A very effective method has three steps. In the first step, identify alternatives which are very good in achieving one objective, for example, very environmentally friendly or very cheap. In the second step, try to identify alternatives which are very good in achieving two objectives, cheap and environmentally friendly. And the third and final round, try to find alternatives which are good in as many objectives as possible. In any decision situation, you can nudge yourself by actively thinking about which alternatives are attractive for you. Do not settle for the obvious alternatives. Always use your objectives and try to find more and better alternatives. Several years ago, I came home to visit my parents for Christmas. After a long drive, I was hoping for a lovely evening with my family. However, this evening was different. My mother told me that she had been diagnosed with breast cancer, that she had to undergo surgery. You may imagine how I felt, but even more importantly, how my mother felt. She had been diagnosed with breast cancer, the cancer which killed her elderly sister, and she had to tell her sons. Sad, desperate, and powerless. For the surgery, a specific type of mammographic analysis was needed. Her doctor suggested a couple of facilities who were able to do this analysis in her hometown. She called them. The earliest appointment was January 29th. She accepted this appointment and decided to enjoy the time with her family while waiting for the appointment. What happened here? My mother just considered the obvious alternatives suggested by her doctor. But why should you do that, especially if it's about life and death? We knew what she needed. Her objective was crystal clear, to get an appointment as soon as possible. And if you know your objectives, it's straightforward what you have to do. Next morning, we expanded the search geographically and made dozens of phone calls. Fortunately, we found a doctor to do the examination the next day in a city one and a half hours away. But what are one and a half hours travel time in this content? The tumor was much bigger than expected. The pictures suggested to have the surgery as soon as possible. So the surgery was scheduled 10 days later more than a month earlier than originally planned. Fortunately, the surgery went well. Afterwards, the surgeon said that the timely operation very likely saved my mother's life. Now, she's cancer-free. Do not accept decision situation as given. Do not settle for the obvious alternatives. Always try to find more and better alternatives. It is worth trying. Ten years ago, before I met my mentor and friend, Ralph Keeney, I was really reactive when making decisions, and I made many bad decisions. 
I didn't think about which decisions I want to face. I wasn't aware of my objectives. I often settled for the obvious alternatives, and I missed many, many good alternatives in my life. In the end, I didn't like making decisions, and I felt that I didn't have much control over my life. Ralph taught me how to become my own decision architect. Ultimately, it's about making decisions more consciously and spending more effort on the so-called decision front end. Actively decide which decision you want to face and how narrowly or broadly you want to formulate it. Identify what you truly want to achieve, what you care about. Identify your objectives and then do not settle for the obvious alternatives. Always use your objectives and try to find better alternatives for you, your family, your organization or the society. You may not always get what you want, but value-focused, proactive decision-making significantly enhance the chance of getting it. In the end, I'd like to cite Ralph Kino. The only way to exert control over your life is through your decision-making. Take advantage of this opportunity. <laughs>